Welcome everybody. Um, a little welcome from me. My name is Rich Daniel Buick. I'm Managing Director at Citizens Online. Uh, I work uh, with James, uh, who can introduce himself in a second. Um, so we've been um, working in digital inclusion and digital skills since 2000 um, and we, we work with members of the public and we provide training and support for people who need help with the online world. We also work with organisations to help them manage the shift to digital working and that brings us yes, right. to um, what we're doing uh, today with uh, working during this COVID-19 situation that we're all trying to work with. So I'll let James say a bit more about that. James, would you like to say hello? Uh, yeah, I was just going to do a, a quick session plan for today. Um, I think we've had a few more people join, so I've just briefly heard someone's um, microphone. So just remind people if you could um, mute yourselves if you're not muted by default already. Um, we've got a little bit more quick intro from us at Citizens Online. More Collective will then present for about 15 minutes and then we'll have about half the session for questions and answers and we'll wrap up with a few resources at the end. You will get the slides sent to you as well as a link to the recording on our YouTube channel at the end so don't worry too much about taking notes. Um, just to reiterate if you want to ask questions or put any kind of comments on the chat then please please do so. So really briefly, um, why are we doing these webinars? We're just starting a new series of monthly webinars we did earlier in the pandemic when some weekly. Um, and in short, it's because we know that those who are most at risk from the virus, people who are older, people who have underlying health conditions, are also among those groups that we know are most likely to be digitally excluded. Again, older people, disabled people, people in areas of greater deprivation. Um, we also know that during the pandemic and during lockdown that a lot of people have found, understandably, have found digital really important support to them. And Lloyd's uh, do the annual Consumer Digital Index where they found four in five people have said that using tech has been a vital support to them. Uh, you can find out more about their research in a previous um, webinar that we ran. So a little bit about our link to Scotland. Um, we, uh, we, we know our uh, lovely guests from More Collective from way back. Uh, we're, we're actually former colleagues and we were working with More Collective before they were More Collective um, as far back as 2000. Come on, who's going to help me out? Um, 2000. 10 years ago. 10 years ago, man. 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, so, um, but we ran um, uh, various projects uh, in the Highlands and Islands, uh, helping people improve digital skills. Uh, we ran most recently uh, a program of work called Digital Highland, which ran up until late 2016. Some of the partners we worked with across the bottom there, um, it was a lottery funded program and we worked right across uh, the Highlands with digital champions working uh, across different areas and reaching different communities. Um, so yeah, that's our kind of link to Highlands. And just to say a little bit more about that, don't worry too much about these maps that might look very confusing. Um, the next session we're going to do is going to be talking about the um, evaluation and learnings that Citizens Online have from uh, five years of involvement in something called the One Digital Programme, of which the Digital Highland project was part of phase one. One of the findings from that is about where we, where the people that we helped are from. And obviously the Highland is one of the most uh, rural parts of the UK. What we found as one of the things through this mapping exercise is that the people we helped were disproportionately compared to the, the population who lived there in the more rural parts. We were really pleased that the digital inclusion work that we did with um, our, our colleagues was um, reaching the people in the most rural parts of the Highland and therefore the most rural parts of, of the country. So without saying too much more about that, over to More Collective. Oh, we just do a poll before we move on to them actually. I'm just going to ask you to find out a little bit more about yourselves. Sorry. Um, so I'll launch this poll and you can vote for as many options as you'd like. We just want to find out a little bit more about your connection to digital um, inclusion. If you're currently providing remote digital support, we'd like to know. If you were providing digital support before COVID, that tells us whether people are doing that as something new since the pandemic and lockdown. 
Um, you might already be working in digital inclusion, but not directly providing digital support. Um, even if you don't do digital support, you might work with people who have low or no digital skills or otherwise be marginalized. You might not be doing that type of work, but you might be working on digital transformation and that might be your interest in digital inclusion. Or you might just be here out of interest for another reason. So we've got about three quarters of people have voted. There's a few more to go. I'll just leave it a few more seconds. Or I'll share the results. So I think that's probably everyone. Um, 19 of 22 now, 23 people. So just to um, explain this, uh, it looks like most people on the call, 15 of you work with people with no or low digital skills. But interestingly, that's a higher proportion of the than are either currently providing remote digital support or who have been doing for some time. Um, it looks like anyone who's been providing remote digital support recently was doing so before COVID. So hopefully we can help a few more of you to provide, uh, get some ideas around providing remote digital support in future. So uh, I not, I wasn't sharing the results with you. I've just um, read them out, but hopefully you can see that how that breaks down quickly there. So I will now hand over to our friends, Irene and Shona. Over to you. Hello. Hello, hello. It's Shona and I haven't really agreed who's doing what in which order, so it's going to be um, quite exciting the next few minutes. Um, my name is Irene McIntosh. I um, work with an organisation called More Collective. We're based in the beautiful far north of Scotland. I'm in Sutherland and I'll take on all comers who suggest that there's anywhere more beautiful than where I live. Um, we work with a team of, there's eight of us um, in the team at the moment. Um, all of us historically have uh, worked with Citizens Online. So um, the next slide is a little origin story um, to do with that. I'm going to hand over to Shona uh, now. Afternoon, everyone. Yeah, as Aaron says, I'm Shona Monroe, work with More Collective. Uh, I'm not sure if Aaron's handing over to me to let you know the origins. The origins are we were all part of of Citizens Online, as Rich had said, and sort of funding uh, came to an end and we decided we're going to continue on our own in that sort of Highlands way that we do. And we set up More Collective because we loved working in digital inclusion. We could see there was a gap. It's what we did. It's what we enjoyed. So we set up More Collective coming up to four years ago now. Um, and it's it's been great. We've managed to take the rest of the, the sort of Scottish team back on board with the, through what we're Citizens Online staff are now with More Collective in the Highlands. And we're spread right across the Highlands. We've got staff up in Shetland. We've got myself in the far north, uh, Thurso. And then we're sort of spread out further south down the Highlands as we go. So we have expanded a lot since that, those four years ago. And we've grown a lot and learned a lot. And um, that, yeah, that, that's the origins of us as digital inclusion. Obviously, COVID's coming along. Not great. But for digital inclusion work, everyone now wants a piece of digital inclusion work. And we have been crazy busy but we've been meeting loads of fantastic new partners, getting involved in most amazing projects and getting loads of people online, which is su such positive um, outcomes, getting those people digitally included that had never been forced to before, never had to before. And now they're suddenly discovering that digital world with the ongoing support that can be provided. That seems to make the key difference. And yeah, so COVID's disaster, digital inclusion going really well at the moment. Um, so yeah, that, that's where we are. Irene, you got anything to add to that? No, if we go on to the next slide, I think. So um, what I guess what we know, and a lot of people will be really familiar with on the call, and as James outlined, is that there's a kind of real link between digital inequality and other types of social inequalities. And we've seen most recently, I guess, the, the impact on health inequalities and that people with low levels of digital skills or no access are unable to access safe health information, they're unable to access education during the pandemic, 
um, or to access even community, some of the community resilience work. All of the third sector organisations had to move wholesale um, online and we've been working with charities across the board since the, the start of the pandemic um, uh, around the particular challenges that both service users and um, third sector staff have had. Um, I've also done quite a lot of research in digital inequality um, and um, really, we're all really familiar, I guess, with this kind of triple whammy of digital inequality, the absence of devices, the absence of connectivity and data and the absence of digital skills. And that's really, those, those three elements are what we need to address to make sure that everyone has the access that they need um, and the ability to access the opportunities the internet affords. So with that as the kind of background, what we, we really wanted to do in terms of um, any COVID response work that we were going to take on um, was make sure that all of the projects that we were working with were taking that kind of three-pronged approach, that they weren't stand alone in any way. And I guess we've kind of got form in terms of we very rarely just go along and just do a class in a community space. We're usually sitting alongside a partner who's an expert in their field and providing some sort of frontline work, whether that's mental health or, um, I don't know, we've done a lot of work with um, the friends and organisations or, so we try and work with um, partner organisations who have um, sort of much more uh, to offer than simply digital skills. And what we also knew was that those partners are absolutely best placed during the pandemic to respond. They're already the trusted intermediaries working with people who need health support or who need food support or whatever kind of support. They're already doing that. So all of the work we wanted to do was sitting alongside those partners and really working within the context of that kind of three-pronged approach to devices connectivity and data and the digital skills issue the inherent part of that um, and, and doing that as part of our COVID response. So I guess we were really lucky early doors um, to be involved in Connecting Scotland and I'll hand shown up to talk about Connecting Scotland. So yeah, Connecting Scotland is, as Irene said, it's, it's a massive project right across Scotland. It's a, a Scottish government initiative that was created with direct response to, to COVID-19 and to address digital inequality for people that are, are digitally excluded at the moment. So as Irene said, it's that three-pronged approach. Connected Scotland are offering a device in the form of an iPad or a Chromebook. Along with that device, they are providing 12 months free worth of data. Um, and that is 20 gigabytes per month and that'll get refreshed every month. And alongside that, they are providing that ongoing support in the form of the digital champion through that third sector organisation. So our part in the sort of larger scale project have been to train those digital champions. So we've been doing online training with them from people from all sorts of organisations, housing associations, local authorities, dementia support, care sector, college sector. It's been across the board. So from young to old, people are looking for support. And we've been working with the staff and volunteers from those organisations to train them up to support the individual that ends up with that iPad, Chromebook and the data so that they, as Aaron said, we know that people engage with digital and keep engaging with digital if they have a trusted intermediary to support them along the way. So we've ensured that the organisation, as Aaron said, they're the specialist, they know their service users, so they're the person that's going to be interacting with the person and that new device and supporting them on their their digital journey as they go. So that's been our kind of the largest part we've been playing in, in Connecting Scotland have been offering that digital champion training, which really just involves boosting that individual's confidence with the skills because quite often people feel really nervous about supporting new recipients with devices or digital skills. They feel that they need to be an expert and they absolutely don't. We need to boost their confidence and go, what you need to be able to do is have a little bit of confidence in your own skills and be willing to give things a try and you can then support that new recipient of the device. You do not need to be a technical genius or expert. So we've been building up the, the sort of organisation, staff and volunteers confidence and over the last six months we've also learned a lot at the very beginning, we as an organisation 
were doing that remote support ourselves. We were helping organisations who were given out devices. So we were supporting new learners and we've learned a lot through that as well. So it's passing on that learning, what works remotely, what doesn't work. Because mm -hmm. um, yeah, obviously when we first heard people are going to be learning digital skills over the telephone for the first time, you kind of go, ah, that's never going to work. This is going to be awful. It's just, oh, it's just, but it works. It's working. There are fantastic stories. We've, we've seen people who have never touched a device before come on and progress and are on that journey on their own and are now sort of flying independently with their digital just from sort of sometimes only sort of four to six weeks support all over the telephone and they have progressed. There's absolute huge potential there. Um, it's obviously not how we would be choosing to do things without COVID. We'd be in a nice cosy room offering coffee and cake and supporting that person in a nice way, but it, it's working. And um, the key thing is the data. The data is a big thing, having that data in their house and not having to worry about that financial poverty has been a big game changer and that ongoing support with their digital champion um, in line with that has made a big difference. So anything else on Connect in Scotland, Irene, or do you want to move on to Get Digital? No, um, I think Get Digital Scotland is a second COVID response that we've been involved in. Um, and Get Digital Scotland is part of, uh, again, a nationwide, um, a Scottish nationwide um, response to um, supporting people experiencing homelessness with digital skills and our COVID response as part of that work and um, so that project exists um, outside the world of COVID um, but the COVID response was particularly aimed at getting devices urgently to people who were rehoused as part of the pandemic response um, and getting devices connectivity and skill and staff up fast to provide immediate and kind of urgent digital skill support really and the devices went to all the participants they received mobile phones with unlimited data um, uh, as, as part of this particular piece of work and it was staff they were really familiar with and the outcomes in that project have been absolutely overwhelming. We've been kind of really, really involved in that one. Um, Get Digital Scotland is the big SCVO ScotGov project and we're a part of a giant machine with sort of seven, I think we've got about 700 digital champions coming through that from hundreds of third sector organisations. Get Digital Scotland is, is much more focused on one particular piece of work. So we've seen absolutely overwhelming kind of results from that. We've seen service users engage far more with frontline staff. We've had 100% of participants able to use their devices, even with remote support, to um, get access to family and friends. So that was all of the participants wanted to engage with that as a priority. We saw them engage um, more with um, health services than they historically have, because this is a really tough to reach client group. And historically, even as part of Get Digital, so even when we've been doing it as embedded support, it still needed quite a lot of nurturing to try and get people online. Whereas COVID, are kind of, it, it, it gave people a very negative push but a push nonetheless to really get them to to access the internet and, and do stuff um, quickly. So um, we're, we're, the link is there for the outcomes of that pilot, but it's been absolutely amazing. Um, we're really proud to have been part of that project. Next one for you, Shona. I think that's where both of us were. were uh... <laughs> Govan Digimates. Yeah, Govan. So Govan Digimates has come about through Housing Association. So Govan Housing Association have been a fantastic partner. All housing associations have, well, I shouldn't say all, there's been a large chunk of housing associations that have sort of come on board and stepped up and realised there's a sort of crisis point here for their tenants and their, their surrounding network that they have in that housing association. So um, we have a lovely partner in Rory over at Govan Housing Association who approached us to just get the whole Govan community. So for anyone that doesn't know, Govan's part of Glasgow City, uh, an area within Glasgow City and they were doing great stuff with digital prior to COVID, but they obviously really stepped it up. They've got digital learning libraries, they got access to the Connecting Scotland devices, so they were doing fantastic things anyways. But we've been brought on board to sort of pull the whole area together, work out where the gaps are in digital, who's doing what, how we can signpost to the right things, um, how useful the devices have been, what they've been used for, and where the gaps are in learning and, and how we and other services within Govan can fill those gaps. Um, 
the big thing that's coming out, we just had a meeting this morning, it's, it's data, data is the problem. There's been some amount of data given out, but now we're six months into projects and that data is starting to dwindle. So devices, there's kind of saturation of devices almost, and now data becomes a problem, which isn't really news to everyone, but it's now becoming very apparent and the evidence, the evidence think, is there. But yeah, I think what's right. really, I was, what I was going to say was I think what's really interesting is the three projects that we've highlighted for today's particular presentation, they all existed in, in one form or another pre-COVID. So we already had the kind of learning about data, devices and skills um, kind of embedded in, in the three different pieces of work. But um, in Govan in particular, what we're doing is we're bringing together partners who haven't necessarily historically been involved pre-COVID. And so they secured the devices really quickly, but then hadn't necessarily thought about the, the, the wider things. And we're seeing that pretty much um, happening in, in lots of pockets, that the devices have been secured, which is brilliant, but it isn't just about devices. We have to make sure that data um, data poverty doesn't then impact on people's ability to access the, the internet and also that everyone um, is supported in developing the skills that they need because we also know that particular groups of people, again the, the research sort of reflects this, is that particular groups of people will have some skills but not all skills. Young people historically will present as having very strong digital communication skills but won't necessarily be able to um, go through online transactions or access universal credit or any of those, especially those young people from lower socioeconomic groups. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, we can have a wee look at what we've learned so far. So no surprise to um, certainly any of the citizens online team, but um, trusted intermediaries, which we've been banging on about forever, literally for a decade, is that digital champions really can make an overwhelming difference. Um, this is working with frontline staff who have the key skills, they are nice people who know how to talk to people. It isn't about being a digital genius, it is about going and walking alongside somebody as you learn together. And we certainly saw that in terms of um, delivering digital skills remotely. Um, that was a massive uh, stress for all of us because we were going, yeah, we've done this digital inclusion stuff for a long time, but we've not done it remotely. So it was really nice to be able to speak to those device recipients and go, no, we're properly doing this together. We don't know what we're doing either. And weirdly, that sounds like a low level of professionalism, but actually what we saw was people responding really positively to the idea that we were learning something new together. Um, we also had a, a kind of a big discussion about whether or not to set up these devices in advance for the end recipients. Um, and we don't have a clear answer, interestingly, from all of the different pilots. We saw mobile device management, um, where we could push apps and push setup onto devices. And that was helpful on the one hand, because the device was good to go, but it gave anxiety for the end user around ownership around surveillance, um, around data privacy. So there was a kind of common come and go with that. Um, with the Get Digital Scotland, what we did was, again, it was a very little, tiny, holistic um, approach that. So the project worker who was, who was working closely with the device recipient asked for permission to set up a Gmail account for the device recipient and that we were able to set it up with data protection consents from the end end learner and also excitingly put on the apps that would be most relevant to the service users and we saw a massive um, sort of engagement with that model but we we wouldn't have been able to do that at massive scale um, but that was something that, that we learned. We also learned quite a lot from supporting the staff in a hands-on way through that setup process because it, it unmasked a lot of staff's own um, absences in terms of digital skills awareness just during the setup of a, a Gmail account, especially for instance with regards to things like location services. So when you have to think about data privacy for someone else, brings up dead interesting discussions. So we don't have a clear, yeah, we should totally set the device up in advance or we should not. Um, we tried both ways and I think both work in different situations. We also had somebody in um, one particular group spoke about how lovely it was to be able to give this device with connectivity 
to um, folk who normally couldn't afford it. And actually the setting up of this thing gave them real ownership and a sense of, God, oh, this is a brilliant thing happening to me. So there's also that as well in it, it kind of thrown into it. So we don't have a yes or no. Mobile device management definitely helps in some situations, but it was really interesting to see that wasn't as easy as we thought it would be. And, and certainly in terms of the actual, what that looked like on the ground, one of the really sort of nitty gritties that we got into was it also created a kind of clash between two systems. The, the user's own personal accounts that they would then set up within a mobile device management system. And that, that was not a very nice thing for any of us. The apps that we went for that you guys may or may not be interested in when we were pushing apps was we tended to go for the main communication type apps, especially WhatsApp because we know, again, that in uh, lower socioeconomic households, that WhatsApp is the most commonly used platform for communication because folk can use it in free Wi-Fi zones. You don't need to have a, a mobile phone contract with data. You can go and use your uh, WhatsApp for somewhere else. We've also seen it used really heavily across the third sector in Scotland. I don't know if it was the same down south, but in terms of support worker staff and things like that, we're using it for video calls. We downloaded Facebook, we downloaded YouTube, and saw incredible things. Folk were doing brilliant stuff with YouTube throughout. Um, we also downloaded BBC iPlayer, which was another one that people, there was also, I think it was Lloyd's research showed that people were moving more towards traditional um, media sources after about, I think, about six weeks. When we lost our initial COVID crazy, people were moving towards mainstream media a bit. So BBC iPlayer and uh, a few other ones, but those were the kind of ones. Facebook as well, We I think I mentioned that. Uh, Duolingo was another one we had downloaded because we had a lot of non-English speakers. And then really interestingly, what we saw is that because it was on folks' devices anyway, we had participants where we'd phone them up and they go, I was just learning a bit of German just before you phoned. So we had this kind of weird knock-on. We put it there for specific groups, but actually more folk used it. Another priority obviously became accessibility for us. We were really used to supporting people with accessibility tools in a one-to-one -one setting, but um, this was completely doing, different doing it over the phone. And we worked with Glasgow Disability Alliance as part of the pilot work. So that was great because that was chopping us in at the deep end really to think about accessibility before anything else, which we should do anyway. Um, but one of the things that we did, which may be helpful, is we all changed all of our own device settings, all our own accessibility settings to start becoming more familiar with it, to make it easier to describe to others. So I changed my laptop settings, my phone settings, my tablet settings, everything I could, I changed all the settings to help me feel more comfortable when I was speaking to the device recipients. And then as well, what we've absolutely learned is that there is an ongoing need for digital skills for digital champions. Um, all of the work we said sort of in the, the wider context of digital inequality, in terms of boosting confidence for folk who were going to act as digital champions. Um, but what we continue to be asked for is more, we need more support around digital skills for digital champions. So that's heavily what we are currently really working on. And we can go on to the next one for you, Shona. <clears throat> Yeah, so well, next for us, we've kind of touched on some of that already, the device saturation. So, it, it, like I said, what's becoming apparent is the devices are there. They're not the difficult part in that sort of three-pronged attack. The devices are quite um, quite accessible for people and it's quite often not the biggest barrier, but the, the data is becoming a barrier and obviously the ongoing support is what we're we're trying to work with now is, is to maintain um those lessons and, and get people engaged with online now that they have device and data. There's no quick answer to the data, um, so we're working with various partners to see how we get around that. Obviously with the Connect in Scotland, the, debate, the data is ongoing, it's a whole 12 months and there's conversations around how that continues afterwards, but with other smaller projects, data is becoming the biggest barrier um, to continue that learning online. We've also seen loads of housing associations sort of step up and realise um, that they can engage with digital and need to engage with digital for their tenants and surrounding communities that they are involved in. So we've got, what have we got? We've 
got at least three different housing associations at the moment asking us for ongoing support and building in that sort of um, digital skills for digital champions as well. So we'll be working with our staff and volunteers. So we're not working with that end learner. We're working with the organisations and the housing associations to provide that sort of ongoing support and how they move forward. Colleges, again, become a massive um, problem um, for their students. Digital poverty, digital data poverty, not having connectivity. Uh, I have another part-time job. I work in my local college, so I'm seeing it on the front line. I've got a class of 14 access students. I think five of them can't get access at home when they're being asked to do online learning. That obviously becomes a massive challenge, and that's that's representative across across Scotland at the moment. Colleges are having large problems getting students access to devices and data. So again, we've been working with colleges and college staff who, what we've discovered largely that connection with the third sector wasn't there previously and there's huge potential for them to work with third sector and third sector organisations to increase um, digital inclusion within within their student cohorts. So we're working on, um, we've got a few colleges on board and we're working with them which is great but that's definitely becoming a more nationwide problem as colleges and universities all start to return and are returning to largely online learning. That's become hugely apparent where the gaps are there. So. Anything I've not covered, I'm conscious of our time, James. Um, anything, Irene, that you're... Well, I'm just dead excited to hear the reporter's questions now. So that I don't feel like I'm just sitting in a room on my own. Let's open it up. You should be able to see everyone. It would be great to see people's faces if um, you're happy to. Um, uh, like I said, only uh, all that will appear on the recording is anyone who, who actually speaks. So um, I'm going to ask Rich if there's someone that we should go to uh, with a question. Yeah, I, I wondered if um, I, might, I might pick out um, uh, a point that was raised, I think it was, let me just double check, uh, from, from Margaret in the chat who asked um, earlier on, how do we identify need in the community? Um, and I'm sure there might be some interesting answers to that. Mar Margaret, you might want to um, you might want to say something more about your question. I know I've picked on you. No, it's okay. It's fine. Um, hi, everybody. I work actually down in Lancashire and South Cumbria on a volunteer project, integrated volunteer project. And one of the hats that I wear is taking part in this whole issue around about digital inclusion. All the stuff you're talking about, absolutely great to hear. And a, a persistent problem is about how we identify people in communities because we can't make assumptions, obviously, you know, in areas of deprivation um, and we can't pick out certain areas, but not everybody falls within that kind of radar. So there's lots and lots of people, like say me, for example, sitting at home, I don't come to the attention of any services, but I might not know how to switch my laptop on and really frightened off I don't do online bank and all that sort of thing. So in terms of um, health, um, digital health and getting people to be able to access doctors online, all that sort of thing, it's a real problem at how we actually reach out to them. So how do we identify them? That's a problem. So one of the interesting things that we've been seeing, especially through Connecting Scotland, and I think it does help that that's a, a ScotGov-led project. Um, so we have massive buy-in from the NHS. So we have a lot of um, family nurse practitioners and health partnerships who are coming along to training and are distributing the devices. So. All, all of the organisations that are being involved, uh, that are involved in Connecting Scotland are also distributing the devices. So they are reaching out in all of these different ways. So it's, they're kind of identifying the people who need the support, because I think you're absolutely right. There's some people there that are not necessarily um, getting third sector support. Um, and so the health contingent are picking up a lot of those people, as are the education guys. So we've also got all of the local authorities um, involved in Connect in Scotland, and they are also involved in the distribution of devices and the identifying people. It's not an ideal model, but I think it's quite hard to think of of one that 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 is. Um, because it's quite difficult to get that information. We know what, um, so the, the kind of research evidence is what, what types of 
um, what demographics of people um, are most likely to need support. Um, but, but that's not really exclusive and it doesn't reach everyone. Sure, is there anything you wanted to add to that? I think, no, I think you've covered it. It's like, we can't, like the way it works, we are definitely picking up the most vulnerable and most excluded within our communities at the moment, working with that third sector who can identify yeah. um, the most at needs. And yeah, at the, it's not going to, it's not going to attract every single person. Um, but as I said, I'm not, I don't know a system that is going to. So it's trying to pick out the most um, excluded at the moment, working with that third it sector. It is nice. So the right people are targeted. It is and nice having the health. It is nice having the health partners involved in this because they're quite new to the third sector element in this I think way both as the well. Health and the education are both yeah. bringing in people that otherwise wouldn't be um, identified. So yeah. we had a, a question in the chat um, Julie, about yeah. health, and uh, Julie, I wondered if you wanted to speak to the to the room. Yeah, Julie. Yeah, ask us, Julie. I've just read your question. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's a real problem with people not being able to access health, uh, particularly during COVID, because before you could just walk into your practice or your hospital or your A&E or whatever, um, and now obviously you can't. So we've been trying to think in Somerset about how we deal with that. And we've um, em we've employed a digital outreach team. We've got three people. That, we haven't got enough people to work across the whole of the county, but we've started in one locality and they're working with the practices to identify people who might be more at risk or people who uh, have a lot of touch points with the practices, so like people with long-term conditions and things like that. Um, and they've been phoning them um, and talking them through how to register with certain online services for health and that kind of thing. But like you say, it's so hard to find those people that are out there that, um, as someone else said, just never talk to anybody, so nobody's aware of yeah. them. So that's yeah. the really hard thing. And if they've got as, something wrong with them, it could be really dangerous. As yeah. part of our Digital Champion training, we do look at health through part of that. Um, we yeah. work with NHS. Um, Scotland, they've got a near me system, so that's a video conferencing system that they use, and as well, they've always used it, but it's obviously been increased with COVID, um, so they can have uh, video conferences with consultants and GPs and things. So that is highlighted to our digital champions throughout the training that these services are there. And you, you mentioned sort of mental health and apps and things, so that can be a big concern. Obviously, if we're not medical practitioners, what do we recommend? What do we do? The NHS, I've noticed Darren's just popped it in the chat. They've got a great online apps library. So you can go and search for topics such as mental health and it will start to recommend apps that are actually being used within the NHS or have certainly been trialled within the NHS. So you're not just recommending cold that this app might be good for mental health, it's got that NHS back in. Um, so we, in our digital champion training, we do go through things like that with our um, organisations. And But yeah, we, digital champions cannot be health experts, but it's giving them hopefully the tools that they can start navigating those new learners to go and, and gain the appropriate health information that they need in the current and, climate. And in, in terms of pre-installing apps as well, certainly in the Get Digital Scotland project, we bookmarked because we couldn't pre-install the, the NHS Inform um, site is a site, not an app. So what we did was we bookmarked that on the device because we also knew that the device was recipients were highly susceptible to misinformation with regards to health. Um, so we were trying to direct them to safe sources of information. So we um, directed them to NHS Inform Scott and we also... The, the Scottish well. government as well. And then we kind of really embedded that message around health with um, all of the frontline staff, really to help them understand, um, because staff hadn't necessarily thought about health in the digital space as well. So we're trying to help them understand NHS Near Me, NHS Inform and the NHS Apps Library. So those were the kind of key things that we focused on. So thanks, Julie, for asking that. Thank you. I'm just going to bring another question in from the chat. Um, so from Lee, uh, Lee's not got a microphone, so I'm just going to read this piece straight out. I think it's a really important question. Um, do you find privacy or security questions or concern are a common barrier when getting people online in general or enabling them to access particular services? 
Are there specific concerns that come up often? Um, so yeah, that whole thing around security, is it, is it specific? Is it general? What kind of stuff comes up? Absolutely, it comes up all the time. For people that are offline, just because they're offline doesn't mean they, they're not aware of scamming and data protection and data privacy. And so they, they hear all these things. Um, so we have to try and reassure them and go, you know, you're right, that you're absolutely right to have all those concerns. I have all those concerns, but this is how I manage it online. This is what I do to try and protect myself online. So it's building up again that confidence can really help. We've promoted it, like Irene said, embedding it from the outset about the geolocation during setup. About once they've taken their device out the box, we encourage the digital champion to talk them through it step by step, which can really raise really interesting discussions like what is geolocation? What happens if I switch that on or off? And we can say, well, if you switch it on, these things are going to happen, you'll get tracked, but you can then track your device if you lose it. You can use maps, it does this. If you switch it off, this is what happens. And it's them then making an informed decision whether they want that on or off and how much data they want to give away at that time and trying to encourage them to take control rather than just say, yes, I'm going to do that because, because I, don't, I don't know what else to do. So it's we've encouraged our digital champions. So although it's more difficult to maybe open up a box and talk to someone through the setup when they're brand new, it definitely sparks really important conversations around data and what they can do and scamming and all again it raises concerns with digital champions about them what if someone does get into danger online and i've i've encouraged them to get online and again you're going you can't take ownership of what people are going to do on the internet all you can do as a digital champion is try and boost those skills for them and send them in the right path but you're not an expert in every field you can only signpost them to sit just like you would in the real world you can signpost them to the experts in that specific industries you can't take ownership of what people are going to do on the internet, but we can embed safety from the very outset, from the taking it out of the box and trying to, and safety is not a tick box exercise either. We all, all of us that are online should constantly be checking what our safety and security settings are doing. So it's not, it's not something that we just know, it's an, it's an ongoing learning journey for us all. And I guess it's getting that message across to the new recipient that this is an ongoing thing. You're absolutely right to be concerned. And here are some of the steps we can take to get you started and make you feel as safe as possible in this online world. I think one of the things that was really interesting as well in terms of the Connect in Scotland oversight, because again, this is hundreds of organisations that are involved, um, is that at the outset of COVID, um, a lot of the third sector organisations, primarily, so the ones that I would probably give us the most obvious example are those working within the, the kind of mental health space. Um, those third sector organisations didn't necessarily want to support people in, it's not they didn't want to support people, they didn't necessarily want to take people into the digital space and they very much wanted to continue working face-to-face, -face, one -to one-to-one as the gold standard of mental health support. Their service users kind of said the same thing, I don't really want to do this, I want to carry on coming in to see you, but we just couldn't. So that was the bottom line is we couldn't do that. So nobody really wanted to do it. And it was around these privacy and security concerns because it's, it's such a, a private issue, isn't it, quite often. Um, but what we have found um, in Scotland over the last while is even though everybody sort of did this not necessarily wanting to do it, the experience both for service users and third sector organisation has been by and large more positive than any of us really expected. Service users have expressed that actually when they are working with that person they trust anyway, they have been able to be handheld into a digital space where they feel safe helping them access that is making them feel safe in that space. Staff have also found they've been able to connect better than they thought they would with that individual. So there were these privacy and security concerns. Staff sort of undertook rigorous kind of due diligence and risk assessment in terms of that digital space, took it in very seriously thinking about that and then were able to explain how they were managing risk in that digital space to the best of their ability in the same way that they would try and manage that risk in a physical space, but only to the best of their ability. And service users and staff have spoken really positively about that. So I find that a really kind of heartening and reassuring outcome really there. Thanks. So just, Ooh, that was a long answer to a question. <laughs> We've got the, the questions have started coming in sort of thick and fast into the chat. So I'm going to um, just pick out uh, Laura <laughs> who's got... Um, uh, something about the the real challenge of um, reaching those people who are just 
really really the hardest for all you know to, to kind of engage with or or encourage to participate Laura did you want to um uh speak to the room yeah um so we're in a position where um pre-covid our digital service was um limited very very limited um but obviously we're having to switch everything up now and and develop new ways of working and um, one of the things that we're doing at the moment is um, uh, SCVO are running a, um, a course I'm taking part in about um, service design, digital service design, and talking about user research and finding out what it is that the users actually want. Um, the problem is that the users that we need to find out what they want are the users that we can't reach because they're not using digital services and trying to get in contact with them to to have that, have that chat is really difficult um, because in terms of from a GDPR point of view, putting them up out of the blue and asking them about digital services isn't in the consent, you know, they, we have consent to contact them for support, but not to just ask them quite research questions. And when we've posted things out with support stuff in the past, your response rate is non-existent. So it was just whether anyone has any suggestions of how, how to reach people um, from experience, really. Joanna? <laughs> no, it's tough. I guess it's a tough one. Um, because, I, I mean, did you say it's carers that you're working with in particular, Laura? It is, yes. It's a, so it's a really vulnerable group who are yeah. isolated at the best of times, yeah. And carers are exactly like you say, um, sort of really hard to reach because they're so um, tied up in their caring role that it can make it really hard. Um, again, what we've seen is the carers, the carers that have engaged have really benefited from digital support because they can do that whenever, um, and it means they can access especially that peer support um, out of ours. Uh, how you reach them, I don't know. I mean, the way we've reached them historically because we have done a lot with Highland Carers up here and we've done work with carers through um, through some of our COVID response stuff with neighbourhood networks and um, the way we've reached them is just old school phoning them up and talking to them and going through them one at a time and um, providing really kind of, so neighbourhood networks were amazing at actually going to the house as part of when they were um, delivering food parcels and things like that because a lot of those folk were in shielding um, and so it kind of went in into the door the question around digital went into their door with their food parcel almost with those responses it, it, with those community responses with the sort of for shielding groups and i know that's, that's a bit of a a wash out and answer because there isn't an easy one but in terms of COVID that's where we kind of got in the door with carers but we saw just a massive kind of uptake and um, because we COVID has created this perfect storm where suddenly everybody goes actually not everyone but a lot of people do go actually it turns out I do want to use the internet I didn't think I did but now that I'm in this rotten situation I do. So that meant we had people who historically would have said, no way, not for me, coming out of the woodwork a wee bit more. But it's not, Laura, it's a rubbish answer. Sorry. It's a difficult question, sorry. It's no, just, I'm, really just, helpful, I'm just filling the ear, you know that, because <laughs> it, it's just hard, is the bottom line. I think, I think it is hard. I think it's it's really tough. It comes back to that trusted intermediaries question, and I think so many of Always. the, you know, the the harder connections to make um, where that works is where we've got those organisations that have already got the link, and there's there's only building on those good connections that really helps things to happen. Um, I'm going to bring in the probably the uh, last or second, um, James is nodding at me, last or second to last question in. I'm just going to bring it straight in, which is a question for everyone really, um, about data poverty. And uh, it was raised in, you know, it kind of came up in the presentation. But what are organisations doing? What are internet service providers and the big phone companies um, doing around this data poverty question that's obviously the big barrier you know we get devices out to people 
um, you know, left, right and centre. But what happens when the data runs out? What happens if the broadband at home is not an affordable thing? So, I mean, James, you might have some thoughts. Uh, you folks might have some thoughts as well. Anyone want to pick up? And I think this time it's Yeah. We're all going. We've all got ideas. Um, I was going to say, I, I will. Um, I was just going to say, from the Scottish I'm point of view, though. In, in, in just briefly, I'm, in a minute, I'm going to do some wrap up resources and I will mention some stuff about the UK situation. But Shona and I, Shona, did you want to say some stuff about in Scotland? I was just going to say more from the Scottish point of view that the Scottish government are addressing it and that they have obviously decided to roll out that 12 months free data and there is conversation around that continuing. So that it is being addressed at a, a government level across Scotland, but it's, it's not enough at the moment and there's still gaps. Um, and it, just a conversation we had this morning, like I said, with, with our Govan Digi meets, it's the devices had gone out with data six months ago and that's now coming to an end. They weren't part of the Connecting Scotland programme that would, it's 12 months that they're getting data for there. So yeah, we've, we're immediately going, right, how do we try and address this? And as yet, we do not have an answer of how do we address these pockets it's, of data poverty that keep coming up. Um, I guess the, the other thing is I mean, that there's the, the housing associations in Scotland, again, are starting to take it more seriously. We're working free with the partners, yeah, the partners that we are working with are heavily now putting free Wi-Fi in any supported accommodation. Mary Hill Housing Association has done blinding work um, in, in terms of um, uh, putting free Wi-Fi in their tenancies. And the other thing that I think as third sector organisations we should be doing is building data into any funding proposals. Funding in general is not, that's not sustainable, is it? If we're all just pitching in for it, but we need to be really thinking what's going to happen. So we've got some responses happening in Scotland. We've, it's certainly been taken very, very seriously at Scottish government level. And um, we're seeing the housing associations, universities and colleges as well are looking at it. Um, there's certainly the university managed properties are looking at, at Wi-Fi, but you know, it's, it's wherever there are masses of people, we should really be trying to campaign for those areas to also include free Wi-Fi. So, so some of the big service providers uh, during coronavirus have um, uh, alleviated data caps and things like that. So, um, uh, or made certain sites like the NHS website um, data free. So if you go there, it doesn't take up any, any part of your data allowance. So there have been various sort of schemes like that. We've been talking to um, some other uh, big providers and starting to have conversations about why, don't, why isn't there a, a big scheme of uh, gifting data. So lots of people have data within a package on a monthly basis and you know they don't use it all up. Where does that data go? It's already been bought. Could we have a big gifting situation where all of, that's, all of those spare gigs, the millions of gigs that goes unused every month is donated to good causes and people that can't afford it? Um, I, don't, I don't know of like a UK or a national scheme that's actually doing that yet, but there is talk of it. I'll um I'll go through back to the slides. Um, I love that, Rich. That's a, I, I think that's get somebody else's mentioned gifting in the thing. It would be amazing. I mean, it, it? does have as the EE or Sky as a provider, they do it on obviously a much smaller scale. You can gift your your yeah. unused data to your but family and friends members. To. But yeah, it seems sensible to to open that scheme up. To roll yeah. over somehow. I'm just, just going to wrap up. I will, I will say a little bit more about that. I'm just going to give some other resources. One, we, we haven't gone through Ooh, all the oh, questions. Thank you. We haven't Sorry. gone through. I'm, yeah, I'm unmuted. Sorry, I started worried. Um, we haven't gone through all the questions, but one thing we've been doing with our webinars is um, I will download the chat. I'll lightly edit it. You'll get it sent out. And if there are questions we haven't had a chance to talk about today that I can answer, I'll put an answer in that in that text file so you get some kind of pointer. Um, do please go and have a look at the More Collective website where you can find out more about what they've been doing. Um, Irene, did you want to say what the deadline is for the Connecting Scotland deadline um, programme? Well, phase case, two, on the call? yeah. Phase two, we think, is the 8th of October. Is that the date we're going with, I mean, Phase two in Scotland, <laughs> Connecting Scotland programme, is yeah. aimed specifically at vulnerable families and people care experienced. Yeah, and that's it to access the devices and data and connectivity and all that. 
Thanks. Um, we've got lots of COVID related stuff on our website. The main page to direct you to is this coronavirus support resources. We've just collated lots of things on different topics. One thing that came up on the call today was digital health. So we've got a number of um, links there. A lot of them, as you can see from Digital Unite, about either guides for people introducing them to particular NHS apps that are in England rather than Scotland, um, and some things that are for digital champions around increasing their skills al along the lines of what Shona and Irene were talking about, um, suggesting best apps to recommend to people and things like that. We've actually done quite a lot of work on um, digital exclusion around health through an, a pre-COVID piece of work we did, which was um, an equalities impact assessment for Public Health England. Um, I mentioned it, we've, we've talked about it on a previous webinar, so you can watch that webinar for an introduction, but it does have a literature review as part of it, which talks about some of the particular um, aspects of digital exclusion around health that might be of interest to people. And in terms of finding where people are, one thing which we didn't talk about earlier in response to that question is we do quite a lot of mapping work. We would look at um, the demographics of people that we know are more likely to be digitally excluded and look at where they are. One thing we've done for that recently around COVID is look at GP surgeries. This is unfortunately only in England. Um, that's the data that's available. Um, looking at the age profile of the patients registered with the surgery to see where are the older patient, where are the surgeries that have got an older patient profile, people might be more at risk in those places. And also to look at the data around who's signed up for digital services already, which gives us a bit of an indication of where are the places where fewer people have signed up, where they might need more help. Um, we have also put a, a, a blog post out around the idea of making sure you ask people when you're contacting them about other things. We know that some social prescribers have done that, some GP surgeries have been doing that. Obviously, we talked about that, that earlier on. Um, just to tell you quickly about our next event, um, that'll be Thursday, the 22nd of October. When I send the email out, you'll also get details of the event right to book on for that one. And as I said earlier, we'll be talking a bit about the things we've learned over the last five years of the one digital program and in particular the last three years the phase two of that program. Um, for anyone who hasn't seen it already we do have an events page on the website which not only includes details of the upcoming events but video recordings of all the past ones and there are a few that are worth mentioning in the context of the questions that have come up. So we've got one of the sessions there is about our process of mapping, mapping where we think people at risk are so you can have a little look at that. Um, we did a session on health inequalities and how that relates to the pandemic. We've done a session on privacy and security, both from the perspective of um, the concerns that might come up and how digital champions might deal with them. And also some of the safeguarding concerns that might be raised, particularly around remote digital support. Um, so do, do go and have a look at those if, if those questions are of interest to you. Just quickly on the question of um, data. So um, we there are some, uh, mobile Wi-Fi options that we, we can talk about. There's cheaper mobile data bundles that you could be buying on behalf of other people. As Rich said, some internet companies have removed data caps for fixed broadband and they've zero rated certain types of sites. And there's a link that you'll get these slides. There's a link if you want to find more about the details of that. When we did our session on English as an additional language, um, both Migrants Organize and Bristol Refugee Rights, they were, they were um, buying data on behalf of the people that they were working with. So they said a bit about that on that, that webinar as well. So with that, I'll say thank you to everyone. I hope that's been useful. Um, as I said, you'll get the slides and some other um, stuff in an email later on today. Um, and our contact details for myself and Rich will be on there. So I will stop sharing my screen and we can all say goodbye. Uh, thanks for joining us.